Генеральная ассамблея ООН в 2000 году провозгласила 20 июня Всемирным днем беженцев. Это было сделано, чтобы подчеркнуть значимость проблемы беженцев, значимость соблюдения их прав и значимость того, что все еще необходимо искать пути решения как истоков вопроса беженства, так и того, как же улучшить жизнь беженцев. Во всем мире проводятся мероприятия, посвященные Всемирному дню беженцев, и Human Consensus присоединяется к этому, и мы сегодня проведем лекцию. Для нас важно поговорить о том, как живут беженцы, и прежде всего в нашем регионе. Мы назвали эту лекцию «Когда есть воля, то есть и возможность помочь». По большому счету, сегодня мы поговорим о том, как это быть беженцем в Европе последние несколько лет. С нами сегодня прекрасная Селена Казакевич, региональная координаторка Датского совета по правам беженцев. И на самом деле не буду задерживать больше своим вступлением, только скажу, что у вас будет, конечно, возможность задать вопросы. В целом мы ориентируемся на то, что наше мероприятие займет час, не больше. И вы можете писать вопросы как в чат, также вы можете после того, как Селена выступит, задать их сами, либо же после выступления все так же написать их в чат. Если вопросы появятся и потом, вы можете их написать нам в Human Constant, в наши социальные сети, и мы будем рады ответить вам и после лекции. После этого я рада передать слово Селени. Thank you, Anita, and thanks uh, to everyone who joined in to listen to uh, today's talk. Um, I would be, I won't be speaking too fast also to give a chance to Alina, I think, to, to translate uh, for you if there is a need for a translation. Um, and um, I will just uh, briefly uh, introduce myself. Um, I am uh, Selena Kozakiewicz, uh, as Anita mentioned, uh, currently working as a regional protection coordinator for Europe for Danish Refugee Council. For those of you who are not familiar, Danish Refugee Council is an international humanitarian non-governmental organization uh, that, has, that is, uh, has a protection mandate. And we are working with displaced persons in more than 40 countries around the world, um, being set up in, in Denmark uh, in 56, 1956 uh, to, until today. We have uh, operations in more uh, than 40 countries around the world. So as uh, mentioned in Anita's introduction, um, today we mark the World Refugee Day. And um, I assume that you have been following latest announcements. But it is important to mention that the record number uh, has been reached with uh, 100, 100 million persons displaced um, up until now, uh, which is extremely concerning for the response and uh, worldwide response, but obviously also since recently, as you're well aware, in Europe as well. Now, while we are talking here about uh, displacement uh, in Europe and arrivals to Europe, uh, you, in the invitation to this uh, talk, uh, you have also seen some of the questions that we will be looking at today. And this is um, the past few years of displacement or arrivals to Europe. Um, what were the main challenges? Uh, also, what is the situation right now with the displacement uh, of persons from Ukraine and what, re what response has been provided so far? And here also Anita mentioned that the title of this uh, talk is When There is a Will, There is a Way, which is also a title of uh, the recent report on pushbacks published by PRAB Initiative. So just briefly to introduce the PRAB Initiative. Uh, it is uh, an initiative formed of um, 10 organizations 
uh, DRC, the Danish Refugee Council, with its three operations in Italy, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Greece, and nine local organizations operating uh, throughout the so-called migratory route from Italy through Bos uh, Hungary, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, North Macedonia, Greece, Poland, Lithuania, and Belarus. So PROP has been um, promoting the rights uh, and advocating for rights of asylum seekers, refugees, and migrants arriving to Europe uh, actively since 2019, when it has been formed. However, dealing with the issues that have been present across Europe since 2015. Now, why do we talk about 2000, uh, and mainly we are addressing the issues of pushbacks from the borders, uh, which uh, in essence entail uh, illegal returns uh, from one country's territory to another without proper process, without access to territory or access to asylum. Um, why are we talking about, why, why do we say that we have been seeing pushbacks uh, all the way since 2015? Uh, migration to Europe is nothing new, uh, but uh, 2015 and 16 brought unprecedented number of people arriving, uh, mainly uh, through uh, the Mediterranean routes and Western Balkan routes. Uh, and uh, while we have been seeing uh, quite an expression of solidarity in 2015 uh, and the beginning of 2016, soon after it was followed by um, unfortunately negative trends of closure of the borders, which um, trickled down into domino effect, basically that countries on the route have been preventing people from moving forward. And the uh, uh, crossing point was more or less the eu turkey agreement, which achieved that uh, mostly those displaced from Syria are to be uh, sheltered and uh, hosted in Turkey uh, with uh, possibility to uh, be resettled in other countries. And this had impacted the movement of people that then from, uh, let's call it uh, a tolerated movement, uh, turned into irregular or how we usually hear illegal movement across the borders of Europe. With this uh, obviously new trend of uh, pushing people uh, back from the borders was recorded, started being recorded and usually involving uh, a number of rights violations in addition to, being prevent to preventing people to access the territory and seek asylum. Usually these were violent uh, acts where people were pushed back also by physical force. Now, <clears throat> since uh, 2021, when PRAB initiative was formed, uh, basically the idea was, although there are many other uh, initiatives and organizations doing uh, incredibly important work on um, collecting and advocating and pro providing uh, essential help and legal aid to people who have experienced human rights violations. Um, PRAB initiative was also formed uh, to collect the testimonies, to analyze the data recorded on different parts of the route and advocate before the relevant stakeholders for the rights of uh, people uh, who are on the move. In, uh, to, in May this year, we have published the most recent report when there is private initiatives have, has published the most recent report when there is a will, there is a way, uh, which uh, besides analyzing the situation at the borders and here it is important to mention that almost two, two private initiative recorded almost 2000 pushbacks only in the first three months of 2022 while well, more than 12,500 uh, pushbacks have been recorded throughout 2021. Um, it is important to mention that the, the recent report when, where there is a will, there is a way, also uh, in a way compares the situation 
um, of the recent displacement of the persons from Ukraine and the uh, uh, solidarity and acceptance and access to rights that is available, uh, but not fully to everyone. Uh, this is uh, the, the PROP report also, well, the, it was uh, obviously unprecedented decision um, within the European Union to grant uh, temporary uh, protection to all persons displaced from Ukraine. Um, there have been some challenges and uh, particularly persons, third country nationals, stateless persons, have been experiencing challenges uh, in uh, seeking protection in Europe, throughout Europe. So this is also one of the uh, aspects that PROP report, report takes into consideration. However, uh, what can be learned very much as a good practice uh, from the response to U displacement from Ukraine is the solidarity and is the efficiency of the response and the fact that it not only resulted in uh, such decisions, uh, uh, groundbreaking decisions being made on, on a European level, such as uh, adoption of uh, temporary protection directive, but it also brought to light uh, the solidarity among the citizens and the initiative to self-mobilize, organize and help out from the usual, from the citizens of the countries to groups to NGOs, everybody was quick to, to respond and provide assistance. Now it is uh, extremely important in the coming months to look uh, at how these decisions are actually put in place, to look at access to rights, to ensure that there is sufficient opportunity for integration and access to social health, uh, social and uh, social assistance and welfare, to healthcare, to education and labor market. And to see and ensure that the solidarity is also followed by a kind of planning and uh, ensured response in case that displacement is prolonged. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll just have uh, some water. <clears throat> so what we have been uh, seeing, uh, obviously, according to the recent statistic, the statistics is that uh, the numbers of uh, persons displaced from Ukraine uh, is right now that uh, more or less some uh, 3 million 400 uh, persons have registered for temporary protection or a similar national protection schemes in Europe, while uh, there have been more than 5,137,000 people uh, being identified staying uh, outside of Ukraine uh, and across Europe. It is here very important to say that um, internal, that displacement within the country uh, is a significant issue, that, that the number of uh, persons internally displaced is still very high in addition to displacement across the borders. Now, uh, these uh, figures are also followed by the information on the return, which is uh, or actually the, the cross-border movement back to Ukraine, which is uh, at the moment recorded, but could not be accounted necessarily to return because there is a lot of movement uh, to and from uh, Ukraine and it's happening uh, more or less on similar levels uh, since the mid of May um, in terms of uh, moving out and, and, and coming into the country. Uh, obviously still the greatest number of persons who have been displaced are, are uh, being um, re registered or have been uh, assisted in Poland. Uh, with uh, followed by other neighboring countries, Hungary, Romania, Moldova, Slovakia. While the uh, movement uh, is also happening uh, to other European uh, countries and some of the good practices have really been uh, setting up of the humanitarian corridor, 
where people could easily move uh, to, to other countries also to avoid overcrowding. Now, while the response, uh, while we did complement the, the response at the beginning uh, and uh, the uh, mobilization of the, of the citizens of all countries, it is also very important to see for how long the solidarity uh, will uh, last uh, because also of the impacts of uh, economic difficulties uh, throughout the Europe right now. And it is very important to ensure that uh, the access to services and rights for, uh, for all displaced persons is uh, planned very well and is uh, uh, happening regardless of the, uh, of the situation and the capability to, to also to consider the capability of individual citizens to show support. Uh, one of the uh, main issues that are uh, being discussed and that uh, <coughs> local organizations and others uh, and international organizations as well as UN are currently monitoring these, as I mentioned, access to rights of uh, third country nationals, of persons who have left Ukraine but uh, ha are not citizens of Ukraine, or, or, uh, don't, don't have citizenship, but have had uh, legal grounds of, of staying in Ukraine. Uh, one of the things that PROB uh, initiative has recorded uh, since the uh, 24th of February, since the uh, uh, the let's say the, the start date of the of the displacement is that a number of third country nationals did have issues in accessing rights, crossing the borders, uh, and have experienced pushbacks um, along the route. So maybe just to have a break right now, and Ira, I would and just to recover my voice a bit, uh, maybe to to start with, if we have any questions and. Uh, make a break here and I can continue. Да, я ещё раз скажу, что вы можете писать, задавать вопросы. я на самом деле спрошу, ты сказала, что в начале тоже был солидарный ответ в 15-м году, но потом всё пошло не так и начались пушбеки, выталкивание с границ. Uh, банальный вопрос. Почему? Um, probably things that are uh, probably because of the reasons that are above our um, how to say, possibility to comment. Uh, obviously, there have been political decisions made uh, with uh, such a, um, a high number, or actually at one point when the number becomes that high, it also uh, brings concerns for the parties about, uh, for, for political, um, uh, for people in power about the support from the citizens or concerns. Um, Obviously, 2015 and uh, now are a bit different uh, because of the, in the, uh, in the way the the movement uh, or the displacement or the arrivals uh, to European countries have been reported. Because we have to remember that they're uh, knowing that 2015-16 was mostly arrivals for from uh, of uh, persons from. Uh, Middle East, from Syria primarily, but also from Afghanistan. Uh, unfortunately, there has been, I mean, uh, xenophobia and uh, um, it, it was uh, basically hitting hard in Europe and the concerns that are, that have not been grounded into actual reality on the ground or the situation of persons displaced. But there is a factor of fear that has been uh, influencing uh, popular uh, views uh, throughout the European countries, and obviously affect uh, the they affect also the decision making of the those in power. Uh, so after the first uh, almost uh, almost a year. Uh, 
uh, of high, such higher number of arrivals, uh, there has been a change in the approach uh, by the by some of the the main, uh, let's say, European uh, uh, some of the countries in the European Union. Obviously, the one of the groundbreaking closure of borders was happening in Hungary and, and Austria and then trickled down through other countries on the route. Uh, but we also uh, remember different approaches. And the one concerning thing is that uh, those countries that are the ones that people arrive first are basically under immense pressure because of the fact that there has been limited solidarity among European countries and the fact that people had very few opportunities to resettle, uh, to move, to be, um, to, to, that the burden of uh, migration is shared across the countries. Um, and for, I'm saying unfortunately, because uh, for what has been seen in 2015-16, there seems to be initiative for this to be changed now. And uh, it is uh, for all of us working in the humanitarian sector and the human rights sector, it is quite concerning that there is uh, stigmatization, discrimination and xenophobia on such, a, on such a high level still present in Europe because we still see pushbacks on all parts of the route, whether it is central Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean or Western Balkan route. And since recently, since uh, August last year, also on the eastern uh, land uh, uh, route uh, of arrival uh, to through um, to Europe. Uh, so, what is the reason? And it, and it is important to see whether uh, you know. Uh, hopefully, not the same, um, not end, but you know, depleting solidarity would be uh, seen now with the uh, with the response to. Ukrainian um, refugees. Thank you. And we have one question. Uh, uh, I will just read it uh, for everyone to be able to understand. Uh, Silena, just small question on the Roma. Uh, what is the current attitude among the authorities and societies of European countries towards the Roma population of Ukraine? Uh, who were also forced to leave Ukraine because of the war. Are there any cases of pushback? Thanks. Thank you for, for the question. Uh, I think um, <clears throat> it is needless to say that uh, Roma uh, are among uh, the most uh, discriminated uh, ethnic groups across uh, Europe, that there has been a lot of issues regardless of, of uh, the war and regardless actually of the country where Roma are present. So uh, starting from uh, access to rights, to education, documentation, even uh, statelessness uh, is uh, quite common. Uh, and uh, obviously the issues have been there even before uh, the start of the, of the conflict. Uh, right now, what... Um, what we can see in some of the countries, there is significant number also of Roma being displaced from Ukraine. Uh, and it is uh, very important and a lot of actors are engaging into monitoring access to rights of uh, Roma population uh, across the countries of, of their displacement. Um, there have been risks or concerns raised uh, about discrimination still and access to rights. Uh, however, uh, we can only be uh, hopeful that people can access uh, legal aid and can access uh, remedies for uh, if uh, these uh, basically violations of their rights occur. Um, in terms of pushbacks, we haven't recorded specifically pushbacks of Roma persons. Although uh, incidents of pushbacks of Roma persons have been recorded by, by our partners before. So we did not record any specifically related to Ukrainian displacement, but we have been recording issues where Roma persons have been uh, mistreated or uh, pushed back because it was assumed, not because they're Roma, but because it was assumed that they were uh, migrants. 
So it also shows the level uh, of the assessments, of the vulnerability assessments, of uh, proper um, interviewing and exchange between those who are entering the territories and uh, uh, and uh, border guards, basically. Uh, this is one of the reasons, specifically the lack of, of vulnerability assessments and uh, the lack of proper procedures at the borders has been one of the key points addressed also by PRAB uh, when it comes to, uh, to the procedures and also to the proposals made by uh, the new uh, pact uh, on um, uh, asylum and migration to Europe. Uh, and these are uh, whenever such violations uh, happen and we manage to, to get information on them, we ensure that we record them properly and to offer the persons who have been who have experienced such violations access to uh, legal uh, support uh, and to to be able to seek the remedies for 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 such uh, violations. Thank you. <clears throat> we had one more question. Uh, I, we can, I can give it now or later, but I mean, it was to what extent do you think NGOs can help Ukrainian refugees to integrate into their communities? I, I think that the uh, NGOs are actually doing uh, quite a number of activities uh, to support uh, this integration, uh, also seeking for connecting uh, possible employers and, uh, and families, depending uh, obviously of the countries. There are a lot of initiatives of local and international NGOs to ensuring that there uh, is, uh, that there are integration opportunities. Obviously, one of the key um, uh, let's say the, the, the key moments was access to education for children uh, and significant number of those displaced uh, from Ukraine have been children and, and women right now. And, uh, and besides that, the, actually the important, the very important uh, aspect of uh, the temporary direct the uh, temporary uh, protection measures or equivalents in the national context has been access to labor market. Obviously, there, there are also differences among the countries how this is actually being implemented and whether this access to um, market is uh, available immediately or there is some waiting time. But even in the waiting time, uh, some of the initiatives such as uh, language learning, depending on, on where people are displaced uh, and, uh, you know, seeking or connecting or seeking these job opportunities is quite important. But one more thing that is uh, somehow important to, to remember is that obviously access to basic rights is very important before we even speak uh, about uh, integration, which can ensure for proper support to people, proper shelter, proper uh, mental health and psychosocial support, which is extremely important for, uh, for the population fleeing from, uh, or fleeing from conflict. And, and this is um, something that uh, also organizations have been uh, engaging with uh, extensively in the, in the last uh, months. Um, I hope that this uh, that this responds to the question. Uh, I think that if, if the question was what else NGOs can do, uh, there have been and, and there should be innovative approaches sought to be able to connect uh, the market with uh, with the persons who are displaced to in to ensure that the information is there but also to ensure that the rights of, uh, for instance, displaced Ukrainian, when, once they entered labor market, are also respected. Uh, one of the huge concerns uh, within this response and one of the risks, protection risks monitored, uh, is actually risks of human trafficking, obviously, whether it is for uh, work or, or elsewhere, the exploitation. So whilst the uh, access to labor market is ensured or 
the income generating opportunities, let's call them that way, it is also important to ensure that uh, adequate rights are followed with that as well um, to, to avoid the, the risks that I have previously mentioned. Thank you. And may I ask one more question as for this moment? Uh, actually, I would like you to speak a little bit about Dublin Agreement, just shortly what it is to explain. And then actually, I want to hear your opinion in terms of um, some comparison to what happened in 2015 in, in a way that a lot of people were pushed to, like in a way, this is a safe, fast, safe country where they arrived. And at least what we see now with Ukrainians, a lot of uh, actually arrive into one country, but then they're uh, quite freely moving forward. And uh, they're asking for protection. For example, they arrive to Poland, but then they're moving to Germany. They are uh, requesting for protection in Germany. So uh, how it, all this is with uh, Dublin Agreement and what is the future of Dublin Agreement? Because I've heard that they're planning to review it Thanks. Yes, I, I think that uh, we, we will yet see what is the future of Dublin uh, agreement. Uh, there is also right now the talks about the coalition of the willing that uh, will be that is launched by several member states within the EU and is uh, is an attempt to reinforce the solidarity among member states to be um, you know, to, to increase the willingness to accept uh, uh, people uh, throughout Europe and, and not really to, uh, to stick only to the, to the old model of work. So the Dublin Agreement basically um, uh, ensures that the persons who have sought asylum or who have came into Europe and went through a safe country where they could have access to asylum, but they I moved think. onward are returned to the country uh, where the first country of arrival, so where they sought asylum, where they were able to seek asylum. And the Dublin Agreement uh, has been um, um, implemented uh, and uh, obviously we have seen the returns. Uh, for instance, our colleagues in uh, asylum office in Denmark are also uh, supporting those who have sought uh, asylum in Denmark but have went through some of the countries to uh, examine whether these, uh, whether Dublin uh, is supposed to take place or whether there are reasons not to um, invoke Dublin agreement there, especially if there are concerns that people might uh, end up being pushed back further. Uh, so if there is a, a risk of uh, refoulement in that case. Now, uh, uh, the, the Dublin Agreement is being implemented, but uh, I am not sure that I can say uh, exactly what was the pace of implementation, because the, the process uh, within Europe is, uh, is also depending on the country, but can be also slow in terms of uh, the asylum requests submitted. Uh, now, what uh, we how come it is uh, different right now with uh, with the uh, displaced persons displaced from Ukraine? Um, the with obviously there has been a lot of uh, advocate advocacy for uh, to ensure that the people who are displaced also have access to their communities so that they have access to support structures and not to limit their movement. Um, and I have already mentioned the establishment of uh, green corridors where people can directly, for instance, from um, Moldova go to Germany through organized flights uh, and transportation uh, and to, to different countries. So obviously, this, this is a solidarity, uh, solidarity movement that uh, promotes uh, not only responsibility sharing, but also alleviates the pressure from the countries of first arrival, which is absolutely essential. It has been also for uh, Greece, it has been for, for Italy who, for, or, or Spain or Portugal, all those countries who are the first ones receiving people. And, and these countries have been receiving people for, for years now. Uh, and 
unfortunately, we do see a double standard there. And this is what uh, most of the uh, organizations and human rights organizations are right now advocating uh, for and trying to, uh, you know, to use the good examples to promote good examples for everyone or, or good responses for everyone, not to have this double standard when it comes to seeking protection. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't, uh, according to uh, to the uh, refugee convention, it doesn't matter where the person came from. It is important that they have access, that they are protected, and that they have right to seek asylum. That that right has uh, been uh, ensured. Um, right now, unfortunately, not only that we uh, that we see the lack of solidarity when it comes to uh, other people that are uh, displaced other than those coming from Ukraine is also the, the recent announcements. And we've heard some from, uh, from Denmark, but also from UK about possible um, uh, movements of, of people to uh, other countries to be processed. Uh, and this is uh, quite concerning from the aspect of uh, human rights. Only recently, European Court for, for Human Rights managed to um, uh, manage to stop uh, the relocation of uh, persons from UK to uh, Rwanda, which was also a groundbreaking decision because um, um, otherwise it would be a terrible uh, a terrible development for for uh, for Europe and for for human rights uh, in Europe but unfortunately I mean there there are a lot of good examples now that uh, could have been there before but there was less willingness uh, among the decision makers and this is one of the of the reasons why with um, for instance collecting these reports on human rights violations it's also important to reach out both to national authorities across europe but also through the, to those um, er, to the stakeholders within the european union uh, to the European Commission, European Parliament, who are uh, supposed to also uh, ensure that the member states are acting according to uh, the international law and uh, the uh, European, European Union uh, also uh, rules and regulations. Uh, and this is why the, we, we do use these reports to, to advocate uh, before these stakeholders uh, and to show exactly these examples of, of double standards and, and right violations. Thank you. Very welcome. Maybe we could uh, just briefly uh, mention, uh, I think when it comes to um, to pushbacks, and this is also uh, relevant for uh, for uh, all the countries. And I mentioned before the lack of um, vulnerability assessment, uh, that some of the protection issues that come out uh, of uh, both the irregular movement or the clandestine movements, but also to the fact to, to what people are exposed at the borders um, are also uh, family separation, um, the uh, improper registration and, um, um, and violation of rights of children, uh, especially unaccompanied and, and separated children, lack of age assessments and lack of ensuring that they are safe and the right uh, procedures have been taken, uh, have been put in place to ensure their safety and well-being. Um, obviously, that comes uh, along with the, some of the, the violations that we mentioned that are, uh, that actually uh, entail use of force. And these have been reported in, in some of the previous prop, uh, prop reports. Uh, what we uh, have been um, basically seeing is that, uh, as I mentioned before, that the lack of these procedures also impacts the third country nationals, for instance, being fleeing from Ukraine. Uh, 
and these are some some of the examples have been captured uh, in the in the recent report thanks to the colleagues that have been present at the borders um, at uh, European Union's external and internal uh, borders as well. Dear participants, any other questions? At least we can give our interpreter a second to breathe. <laughs> and to Selena too. Do not hesitate, but if not, uh, then I don't know if you want to, to say something else. I don't know if uh, if it would be which lessons uh, we should learn uh, from. Yeah, from. Pass, from past in order to avoid the similar situation with Ukrainians soon. I mean, I think to to take uh, those who are decision makers accountable would be very important, and to uh, support th those who are displaced in um, seeking and uh, accessing their their rights and and making sure that their voice is heard. Because what we have been seeing from um, 2015 is that uh, actually um, people who have been arriving to Europe and moving uh, at some point uh, started being numbers. They started losing their voices and, and stopped, uh, stopped uh, uh, being heard. And uh, it is extremely important for all that are displaced to be able to speak about uh, the their needs uh, and to express their concerns and uh, to uh, ask for support where they need it, whether it is to to access the the rights that have been granted to them or to seek uh, other types of of support. But I think primarily to hold those. Uh, to hold decision makers uh, uh, also accountable uh, as uh, citizens of, of the countries where we live, but also uh, across Europe. Uh, and to ensure that one of the, the greatest concerns uh, is that uh, countries seem to be turning their back on what used to be groundbreaking uh, developments in international law, in international humanitarian human rights law, that uh, now uh, some of the governments are, are turning their back to them and to the convention signed and trying to find legal ways to avoid uh, respecting these rights. And this is uh, extremely unfortunate and uh, very, um, yes, it's, it's, it's going backwards uh, instead of uh, seeing how to improve the conditions and how to ensure that you know, positive examples are showed. Having in mind that the biggest number, and we are here talking about World uh, Refugee Day, but the biggest number of persons displaced is not in Europe. We haven't even, uh, haven't even come close to Europe. Um, and uh, not to mention the almost the forgotten displacements, uh, which haven't, uh, haven't happened that long ago in, in Syria, from Syria, from Iraq, from Afghanistan, and from other countries uh, from within Africa and South Sudan, etc. Um, and yes, a lot of eyes are and discussions are, are now happening also with uh, the um, global warming and, and what kind of, you know, ecological consequences will that bring to people's movement. So there is a lot to, to prepare for in a positive way. And definitely the response hasn't, the response in terms of closing eyes to, to what is happening and turning the back to, uh, turning back to uh, human rights has not been a good approach because ultimately it also didn't stop people from moving, whether we talk about migration and it didn't stop conflicts. And unfortunately we see that 
also now with Ukrainian uh, displacement. So uh, evidently, uh, it is important to, to demand and to, to look forward and to ensure that the rights of people are protected. Thank you. Yes, we stand with refugees today in World Refugee Day. And I'm very grateful to Selena Kozakevich from Danish Refugee Council, who spent this evening with us talking about uh, refugees and the situation not only in Europe, but yeah, but mainly we were here speaking about European situation. And still, dear participants, if you have questions, uh, do not hesitate just to write it to us and we will be happy to answer it even later. So on this, I will just thanks again to Selena and to everyone who was with us today and have a good evening. Thank you very much. Alina, thanks a lot. <laughs>